So I'm excited to get to be with y'all tonight um, as we are in our final week of this series. If I have not had the opportunity to meet you, as we have a few guests, I think, here tonight, and some of the high schoolers, I haven't had the opportunity to talk to you much since we've been hanging out with middle schoolers. I am Alex Williams, our new minister to middle school and recreation. I am the better looking, younger version of Ryan. So if you are looking for me, you just find the better looking guy in the office and um, you'll find me. So no, I'm just messing with him. Ryan's been great to work with um, and he loves you guys so much. Um, and I'm learning so much from him um, and the rest of the staff here. And I'm excited to be with you all and speak both with our middle schoolers and our high schoolers all together this evening. You may be wondering why we're all together, and that's simply because upstairs is under construction right now because part of us moving to the MAC is also fixing the upstairs so we can spread some Sunday school classrooms out and all of that great fun stuff. That's all coming to a close. As John mentioned and Zach mentioned earlier, this is our last night meeting here. Um, in Revi or for Revive, so we are excited for that. We have a brand new building with a brand new worship facility. Um, see, even the Holy Spirit's moving somewhere out here, all this new music coming on still. Um, but anyway, so we're excited. This is our last night here, and we're ready to get over to our new building. The last few weeks, really the last couple months, we have focused on this idea of evangelism, of taking the gospel to one person, to, in our friend groups, in our schools, on our sports teams this year, to reach one person for Jesus this year. And we talked about, went through the part of the book of John and looked at different aspects of John's life and his ministry and what he witnessed and experienced and how we can apply those truths to our life. In the last couple weeks, we've continued that same idea of reaching other people, but taking our fears, taking our worries, taking our pressures and flipping them so that we can put them in the past, put them aside, and be willing to take the gospel to our friends at our schools and on our sports teams. The first week we kicked off with identity and we talked about how the world tries to get us to put our identity in other things and it causes us to fear who we are, that we're not enough, that we, don't lack, we lack the tools and the knowledge and the ability to go out and share the gospel because we put our identity in things like relationships and social status and our presence on social media and all of those things fail us. But if we're willing to put our identity in Jesus, we can overcome the fear of not being enough. Last week, we talked about ability and knowledge that maybe we don't know enough or maybe we don't have enough skill set that we feel to take the gospel to our friends. But if we are willing to step out of that comfort zone and know that God is enough, and even though we may not know enough, even though we may not feel equipped enough, that God is still working in our lives and has a plan, if we're willing to set our fears aside and reach and talk about our faith in Jesus. All of the fears that we have discussed over the last couple weeks have been real fears that one man has faced. And that man, his name was Moses, right? That's who we've been talking about. His life and his calling by God to ministry to the Israelites. And these were all fears that were really real to Moses that he faced and he had to come to grips with. And oftentimes, I think when we think about Moses, we think about this man who challenged the Pharaoh of Egypt and called plagues on um, Egypt. We think of a man who took his cane and hit the Red Sea and it parted and he led millions of people across the, the Red Sea to escape from captivity. Sometimes we may even think of a man who was mighty in faith and in prayer with God that he called down from God food and manna to feed his people. And while all of these stories and thoughts about Moses are really true and factual and they're fun to think about, before Moses became this mighty man that we think about him often, Moses had to address and overcome some of the fears and excuses he had in his own life in order for God to begin a mighty work in him. And this week we are going to take a look at one more fear that Moses had to deal with uh, before God used him to impact millions of people. Before we get started, I want to tell us a story. So this is a story about myself when I was growing up. When I was younger, like third, fourth grade, I had like two or three really close friends. And in the process of their parents, I lived in an area that was um, a big military base was close by, a big Air Force base was close by so it was very common that you would have friends for a couple years or maybe even a year and just by the time y'all started becoming really good friends they would move away 
And around this time, I had two really good friends who one was in the military and one parent was not. And the family who was in the military, one of my close friends, they got a different assignment and they had to move. And one of my other friends, right at the end of fourth grade year, she was who I would have considered my best friend at the time. She also moved away. And so when I was entering into fifth grade, I found myself in a really weird predicament that I didn't really know who I was or who my friends were. And I began to think to myself, man, I have to be a certain way so I can have friends who are in a certain group who act a certain way. And I began to shape the idea of not me not fitting in or me being rejected. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Because as, as a fifth grade student who was about to go into middle school, who didn't have a whole lot of friends and couldn't figure out where he fit in, that kind of shaped my three years of middle school. It shaped of me trying to be a great athlete, a great wrestler who would win matches and people would like it began me to do well in school because I wanted to be up there with some of the people who are really smart in my class because I wanted to fit in. But deeply, the reason was it was because I had a fear of rejection. I didn't want to be rejected. I wanted to be the person who could fit in. And tonight we are going to discuss the big fear of rejection. See, rejection was a big fear for myself in fifth grade. It was a big fear for Moses thousands of years ago. So I have no doubt tonight that it is also a big fear that many of us face this evening. That when we go to our school, we are afraid to step out on our, in our faith to share Jesus with our friends and with our family members because we are afraid of rejection. Rejection can come in several ways, but it really only has one answer. And tonight we are going to look at that. We are going to look at the couple ways that rejection shows itself and how we can overcome this idea of being afraid of rejection and flipping that fear to be someone who can step out and share our faith with our friends and family. So tonight we're going to be in Exodus chapter 4. If you have your Bibles with you or you have the Bible app on your smartphone, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 4. If not, it'll be up on the screens. Exodus chapter 4 verses 1 through 8 is where we're going to start. And then we're going to jump through to verses 18 and 19. So again, one more time, Exodus chapter 4, 1 through 8 is where we're going to start. Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, what is this in your hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it and it became a staff in his hand that they may believe that the Lord, the God of the fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside of your cloak. And he put his hand inside of his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, he was leprous like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So when he put his hand back inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his body. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first signs, that they may believe in the latter signs. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it out on the dry ground that the water, that the blood shall be taken from the Nile and will become blood on the dry ground. So skipping down to verse 18. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt and see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go back to Egypt. For all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So we understand that this is the part of Moses' life that's coming back full circle here. That Moses had killed a slave master. He was on the run from Pharaoh and from his brother and from their army um, who were looking for Moses. And he ran for years, about 40 years, he was gone hiding at his father-in-law's land. And so this is where we come in. We have this see where God um, comes to Moses in a burning bush and he begins to have this conversation with God. In the last few weeks, we talked about the fears and excuses Moses had. And this week, we are going to look at the last excuse that we see with Moses about his fear of rejection. And the first part that we see Moses concerned about in terms of fear of rejection is the first part of verse 1. Moses says, then Moses answered, Behold, they will not believe me. 
Moses thought that when he went to the Israelites, they wouldn't believe me. They wouldn't believe him. And I think that is a thought that crosses many of our minds when we begin to think about what it means to take the gospel to other people. That the people we are going to share it with, the friends we're going to share it with, the teammates we're going to share it with, they're not going to believe me. Moses' expression expressed to God that if he went to the Israelites with a message of freedom, that they simply would not believe what he had to say. And that it wouldn't be true in their eyes. And I don't know about you, but one of my biggest frustrations and frustrating things that I have experienced in life is when I have something really true or really factual that I've researched, I've studied, or maybe it was something I learned in class, and I go and talk to someone about it and tell them about it, and when I talk to them about whatever this may be, they don't believe me. Or maybe in some extreme cases, they're like, no, you're a liar. Like, that is just completely false. You don't know what you're talking about. You are crazy. And I think it's frustrating for two reasons. One, you know that what you have to say is actually right. It's actually true. You've, done, you've taken the time to hear about it and learn about it, whatever it may be. You've taken the time to research it and think about it. And so you know with your best guess and your best effort that what you are saying is true. And there's nothing more frustrating than someone saying, you may think it's true, but that's not actually true. But I think the second thing that makes it even more frustrating, and this is kind of even deeper, is that whenever someone tells us they don't believe us, there's this small voice that's in the back of our head that begins to have us question, well, how much do they actually care about me if they don't believe me? If they peg me as someone who is a liar, do they actually love me? Are they someone who is actually my friend, actually cares about me? And I think that's a thought that comes into our minds many times when we feel like we're not believed by someone else. I don't know about you, but one of uh, my favorite shows growing up was Drake and Josh. I watched probably every episode of Drake and Josh. It has kind of made a resurgence now that it's been, I think on Netflix or Hulu, whatever it's on. And there is one episode, it may even be the first episode, I think, that has also become a meme recently, and I've seen it on TikTok and other places, is the first time that Drake and Josh really have an interaction they're, they're stepbrothers, they come, their parents are married now, and they're living in the same household. And they begin to think about a time when they were younger, when it happened that they were actually both at a um, Padres game. And during this Padres game, there was a whole bunch of stuff that happened, and Drake had one side of the story to it, and Josh had another side of the story of what happened, and they are in the living room in front of their parents, bickering back and forth about how this event actually incur, um, occurred. And then you have the sister in the middle who's really enticing this and trying to make it even worse and make them upset at each other and frustrated at each other. And in the middle of it, Drake says to Josh, are you calling me a liar? Right? And his response is, well, I'm not calling you a truther. And so even in this moment, they are yelling and bickering back and forth. And the dad interrupts and the mom interrupts and they try to remind them, hey, y'all are siblings. Y'all have to learn to get along. You'll have to learn to love each other. And you can see kind of this picture that you can tell that the love and the relationship there is at a strain because even in this kind of silly moment where they're bickering back and forth, there is something that is disconnected. And that is them believing each other of how this story actually unfolded. And this is not something that is only dealt with between two characters on a TV show, but it's also a very biblical concept. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth when he says this whole chapter about love and what it means to love and how we love and all of these things. And in the midst of it, one of the statements he makes is that love believes all things. And this may be a verse that you commonly um, have heard read or spoken at a Christian wedding, or maybe it might even be engraved on a wooden hanging that is on the wall in your grandma's living room over the mantle. But although this is a great verse that is used frequently that married couples can hold on to, as it was one that was recently read in mine and Kirstie's wedding, Paul is originally talking about a love that is extended to other people and the love that is extended to us. And that is the kind of love that is found when we believe each other. Part of the very core of what it means to love others and to feel loved by other people 
is to know that people believe you when you speak to them. We feel loved when we know that the first assumption of other people about us is not that we are a liar or is not that we don't tell the truth or that we constantly exaggerate, but we find love from other people when they have full confidence in us and in what we are saying is truthful. This is why I think the fear of being believed is such a large hurdle that even a great man of faith like Moses had to come face to face with. The desire to be loved is one of the greatest parts that makes us human. So when we think others might not believe us or love us, we curl up on the inside and choose not to share our faith with other people. We want other people to believe us. We want other people to love us. And when that thought crosses our mind and we begin to fear it, we choose not to share what God is doing in our lives with other people. The second thing that we see with the idea of rejection in Moses' story here is the second part of verse 1. Moses first said, Behold, they won't believe me. But next he says, They won't even listen to my voice. I think we often fear that other people will ignore us, that they will ignore what we have to say completely. As Moses was wrestling with this fear of rejection by the Israelites, he tells the Lord that he was fully convinced that not only will they not believe him, but they won't even listen to his words. In other words, he thought that the Israelites would completely ignore him and the message of hope that he was taking to them. And I think to myself sometimes, how scary of a thought is that to us? How often, how often do we find ourselves in that same situation? That when God calls us to share the message of hope that is found in Jesus Christ, there is a chance that we will be completely ignored and put to the side. That we will be excluded from things, that we won't be asked um, to come to certain events. I have no doubt that if I asked everybody to close their eyes and raise their hand tonight, if you've ever been excluded for something or haven't participated in something, intentionally excluded from something, probably at some point everyone has experienced that and every hand would go up. No one wants to be the person who doesn't get invited to parties or the person who isn't inclu included in the latest Snapchat groups or the person who doesn't have anybody to sit next to at lunch. And we think to ourselves that if we are the one who steps out in faith to share salvation in our story with our friends, we will become that guy or that girl who is ignored and left out of all of the things that we were once a part of. And if you are anything like me and you have FOMO, the fear of missing out, then this is like a big deal to you. You want to be a part of what's going on. You want to make sure you are involved. Uh, you, you could care less whether your friends and family members get you Christmas presents, but as long as you are invited to the pool parties that are happening and the social parties that are going on and social functions that are going on, then you are great and dandy. That is what you want from your friends. You just want to be invited. And so that is a big fear that we have to come to terms with. That when we decide that we are going to step out in our faith and we're going to share Jesus with other people, we have to be willing to put aside the fears and the thoughts that, you know what, there is a possibility that I might not be looked at the same way. There is a possibility people might not believe me. But the last part of what Moses begins to wrestle with here as he thinks that he has a fear of rejection is that they will grapple with me. In the final part of Moses' fear of rejection, he tells God that the Israelites are going to grapple or argue with the promises that he had called Moses to take to them. He specifically says, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. He suggests that if he listens to the call that God has on his life and he follows through with what God is asking him to do, to take the good news that these people are going to be set free from their captivity and their bondage. That they're going to invalidate all of the claims that the Lord has just made by saying, you know what, Moses? Not only do I not believe you, not only do I not even want to listen to you, but honestly, what you are saying, that probably didn't even happen. You're crazy. Like, God just doesn't come to people in a burning bush. He didn't tell you these things. We're going to be stuck in captivity, and there is no good news for us. You just go ahead and go on, on your way. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to listen to it. And you know what? That probably didn't even happen. I remember in middle school, 
When I first started wrestling, the, the only sport that I participated in for seven years was I wrestled from sixth grade to 12th grade. And some of my favorite and easiest matches came from when I wrestled the kid who I would go out there, he had no idea what he was doing. I would hit a blast double leg, take him down, I'd put him in a cradle, I'd pin him, the match would be over, I'd get my hand raised and it was done. Those matches are fun because they last you know, a minute or two. You got the victory, you killed it, you nailed it, everyone's cheering for you, you come back, you get slaps on the back and the hands and all this stuff as you're running down and it's a fun and exciting moment. But unfortunately, those are usually the exceptions because there have been plenty of matches that I have wrestled that didn't quite go like that. That when I walked up and out to the mat, the kid who was in my weight class walked onto the mat because I weighed 120 pounds and I was skinnier, even skinnier than I am now. And this kid was also 125 pounds, but he looked like Justin Brown. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I gotta wrestle this kid. I don't know how well this is gonna go. And that is the moment when it's like, all right, this, this, is, this ain't gonna go too well. He's, he's a little stronger than I am. He's probably been training for a long time. And I know that this match is not gonna go down in like a minute or two. It, it's gonna take the full six or seven minutes and it, it's gonna be a brawl. And it's in those matches when we go back and forth, we're going toe to toe, we are scoring point here and point there. And then you get tired and then all of a sudden in the midst of this battle as you are grappling with someone else, this kid, hits you with a double leg, slams you on your head, you have a concussion, a ruptured eardrum, and you have to go to the hospital after that. That has happened several times to both myself and other people, and I've experienced that all too well. Those are the moments that I hated in wrestling. I didn't want to be the one getting beat on because nobody wants to be that guy. And sometimes I think it feels like our world is filled with the kind of people who are waiting to pick us up and drop us on our heads, right? As we look around to our friends and our schoolmates and our teammates and even our neighbors and family members, we live in a time where there are people who are ready to argue about anything for any reason at any time. They want to prove us wrong. They want to make us feel small. They want to make us feel like what we are talking about could never happen. This is very true recently, as we've seen in the last couple nights, with politics and debating, but it doesn't just stop there. It doesn't hold off just in the realm of politics and what people believe there, but it also spills into the misguided way of thinking and affects us in our spiritual lives as well. We fear that if we grapple and arc, we fear as we go on and we have to grapple and argue with other people, that we're gonna lose that match. Because our society tells us that the person who yells the loudest and argues the most times, that they win. And if they win, what they have to say is the truth. And that is the bottom line. That if you can yell the loudest, if you can argue the longest, you win. And when you win, your word is now what is true. It doesn't matter what was true for you originally, as long as I won the debate, then what I have to say is true. So in those moments, we worry and we think that we have to come up with some sort of way to prove that God exists or that the Bible is true if we really, truly want to be able to share our faith with other people. And that if we can't do that, if we can't prove God exists or that his word is true, that we might as well not say anything. Because if our God and his word could never measure up to the standards of this world that swamps us with, then why should we even try because of this fear of having to grapple with other people and debate with other people and the fear of being challenged by other people and argued with by other people about our faith and who Jesus is, we choose to remain silent in our fear and to stay quiet about the hope and the good message that God has sent us here and has created us to take to our friends and to our schools and to our family members. After Moses interjects all of these claims and fears and excuses as to why he can't do it. Eventually he comes to a point where he even tells God, you know what, I'm done with all this going back and forth. You might as well just find someone else. It's not for me. But after he tells God that he is worried about people won't believe him and people will ignore him and people will grapple with the idea that what he has to say just never could have happened, God asked Moses to do something crazy. First, he asked Moses, hey, you see that staff that I just turned into a snake? I want you to grab that snake by the tail. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like snakes. I don't like snakes at all. 
I'm not going to touch a snake. I'm not going to be around a snake. So if someone asks me to grab a snake, you can guarantee it's not going to be me who's going to do that. But God says, hey, Moses, I want you to grab this snake by the tail. Grab it. And Moses, crazily enough, goes ahead and he grabs the snake by the tail, pulls it up, and it turns back into his staff. Then Moses is sitting there and it's like, okay, God, this is pretty wild. And God says, you know what? I got one more thing for you. I want you to stick your hand inside of your robe. It's like, okay. So he stuck his hand inside of his robe and he pulls it back out. And now Moses had leprosy, which at that time was the most dreaded and deadful um, disease that had, they had ever known. If you had leprosy, we know a lot about that, that they would push, us, push them to the side, they would exclude them, and it was basically a death sentence if you had leprosy. And God said, you know what, Moses, I'm going to show you who I really am. I want you to stick your hand back inside your cloak. And at this point, if this was me, I probably wouldn't have enough faith to do that. I would say, God, I have this deadly disease. You just turned this pole into a snake. What is sticking my hand in my cloak going to be? So Moses goes ahead, sticks his hand back inside his robe, pulls it out, and he's healed. But in those two moments, it wasn't him being willing to pick up the snake that was what God was getting at. It wasn't Moses being willing to stick his hand inside his robe twice that what God was getting at. But what God was getting at, he was asking Moses that if you want to overcome these fears, if you want to be able to take this good news that I have for my people and impact millions of lives and set a new course of history for the rest of the world one day, all I need you to do is have faith. And if you put your faith and your hope and your trust in me, I can overcome all of the fears that you have. Verse 18 tells us that he goes back home to his father-in-law. And his father-in-law says, Moses, you need to go. You need to listen to the Lord and you need to go. And when Moses leaves and he begins to talk to the Lord again, the Lord tells Moses, go back to Egypt. Go back to the place you're running from. Go back to the place where you were a criminal and murdered a man. And have faith that I am going to move, that I am going to change lives, that I am going to free those people, that they will believe you, that they won't ignore you, that they're not going to grapple with you, that they're not going to think you're not enough. They're not going to think that you don't have enough ability. They're not going to think you're too bad of a speaker. But if you put your faith and your trust in me, I will move in their lives in such a way that you will change the course of their lives. Moses began his life as a criminal with great fears, and his life ended as a man with great faith who impacted millions of people with the good news that God had for them. But as we begin to wrap this up tonight, and our band begins to come forward, there was one step that Moses had that took him from one extreme, that took him from a man filled with fears to a mighty man filled with faith that changed the lives of millions. There's one step. And that one step was confession. He knew that he was filled with fears. He knew he had a laundry list of reasons and excuses why it should not be him who was called and sent to take the good news that God had for his people. And as he began to realize that Moses confessed those things to God. He told God, I'm not enough. I don't know enough. I don't have the ability to do this. I'm going to be rejected. I'm not the right guy. You need to find somebody else. God was willing to answer what Moses had. He was willing to give him guidance. He was willing to give him peace. That indeed, he was the very one that God wanted to use to make an impact in other people's lives. As we look in the New Testament at the Great Commission in Matthew 28, we also have this same opportunity. God has called us to go just like Moses was called to go. God has called us to go to our high schools, to go to our middle schools, to go to our sports teams, our bands, our choirs, our families, and take the good news of Jesus, to take the good news of hope and salvation 
to take the good news that our friends and family who are weighed down by sin and the evil things of this world, that they can be released just like the Israelites from bondage and slavery that holds them back from having true life and eternal life found in Jesus Christ. So tonight, you should have received both the handout to write notes on, but also a little square slip. And on that little white square slip, it says, My fear is... What I want you to do tonight is I think we all probably have, it, like Moses, at least one, maybe more, but at least one fear or one pressure that is holding us back from fully sharing the gospel in our faith, in our story, with our friends and with our family. What I want you to do is I want you to take just a minute and write that fear down on that paper, whatever it is. If you need a pen, we can get you a pen. But whatever that fear is, I want you to write it down, whether it is a fear that you're going to be rejected, a fear someone's going to make fun of you, a fear that you won't fit in in a friend group, a fear that you don't think you know enough about the Bible, a fear that you just aren't an eloquent enough speaker and that you're going to stumble, that you don't think you have enough Bible verses memorized to be able to share your faith. Whatever that fear may be, it's, no, it's not too big and it's not too small. Just write it down. After you write it down, I want you to take a minute. Just bow your head and confess that fear to God. Tell him, God, I am afraid. I'm afraid that I'm not going to fit in. I'm afraid that I don't know enough. I'm afraid that my identity is found in something else, Lord. I'm afraid I'm going to be rejected. I'm afraid people won't believe me. I'm afraid people will argue with me. And as you take the time to pray over that, take a minute, bow your head, Pray that to God, whatever your fear is tonight. And as our band comes up and begins to play in a minute, what I want you to do is after you've prayed that prayer, after you responded to what God is doing in your life, we have this cool little fire pit up here. And obviously we can't have a real fire in here. That'd be cool. But we can't. So what I want you to do is I want you, after you've taken the time to write your fear down, after you've taken the time to pray over it and confess it to God, I want you to come up here just one at a time and throw it in this fire. Let it be burnt up. Let this be a moment where you let go of that fear. And when school starts tomorrow, there is a brand new student who is ready to take their story, their meaningful story, and their faith in Jesus Christ to their friends, their sports teams, and their family members. So after you pray, come up and drop it in here, and then you can go back to your seat. And we're going to have a time of invitation. Maybe you're here tonight, though. You may be here tonight, and you may be thinking, I don't have any fears about this. And the reason why you don't have any fears about this is because there has been a, not been a moment in your life where you've taken the time to surrender and have a relationship with Jesus. And if that is you tonight... I want you to come talk during this time. All these students are up. No one's going to see you. No one's going to notice you. I want you to stand up and go find one of the adults that we will have stand in the back and talk to them and ask them, what does it mean to have a relationship with Jesus? What does it mean to be willing to take some sort of faith to my friends? Because I'm not familiar with this. And we have so many great small group leaders and adults here tonight who want to tell you how you can have eternal salvation tonight in a relationship with Jesus tonight. So I'm going to pray for us, and I want you to write the fear down. I want you to come, pray for it, drop it in this fire, come back, and we're going to have a moment of worship and a time to wrap up. Father, we thank you for tonight, God. We thank you that in the midst of our fear and our concerns, Lord, that you are calling us to step out in faith, Lord, that you are calling us to be like Moses, 